1991, when Nelson Mandela walked out of prison, he said, as I walk out the door towards the gate, that would lead to my freedom. I knew I didn't leave my, if I didn't leave my bitterness behind, I'd still be in prison. And that is what influenced what happened in South Africa towards a peaceful negotiation. Now I'm saying this because I have structured my presentation talking about the broken clay pot. Now for those who are not aware, Nelson Mandela was a chief. And in our traditional communities as Africans, when men sit in Khotla, a Khotla is where the imbizo takes place, where the pizza takes place. And imbizo in my language is pizza. And the Khotla is a, a, a place where men under the leadership of a chief or a king would sit and discuss and come up with local solutions. So Nelson Mandela being a chief, I believe that as he left prison, he thought of the values and the norms and all that actually brought and, and, and the communities together and created community, which was always having to be able to forgive. Because in those courts, that is where conflict management was done, and that is where peace was always guaranteed. So hence, I'm talking about the clay pot, because it is of significance in African culture. A clay pot is used to serve love. It is used, used to create peace, to talk about peace, to bring happiness, to promote forgiveness, to ensure that healing takes place in a community, in families, amongst individuals, to promote restoration, to bring about equality, and also to, and to promote caring and to show caring. And I believe that these are critical elements of reconciliation. And in traditional courts and in traditional imbizos, in traditional quotas in our communities in African, as African culture, reconciliation comes from the Lekota. Now when these men are sitting in Kota, drinking African beer from a traditional clay pot, they actually share it. It moves from one man to the other. And as it moves from one person to the other, for me, it signifies connectedness. It signifies oneness. It signifies caring. It signifies Ubuntu, which is Botu, humaneness. In our culture, we say, I am because we are. You are not existing unless you, are ex you exist amongst others, because a person is not an island. It signifies togetherness. It signifies sharing. It signifies wisdom. It signifies collectiveness, consultation, presence, and celebration. And in a clay pot, what is it that we want? Because a clay pot comes without nothing. But what goes into the clay pot is what we want. And I believe that as Canadians and as South Africans, what we want 
is reconciliation. And therefore, I use the analogy of a clay pot because it signifies a reconciled nation. Now, reconciliation is like a process of manufacturing a clay pot. Because when you manufacture a clay pot, clay is formless before it becomes a clay pot. And that whole process is a transformative process. It's an enduring transformational process. And it is a process that is highly controlled. At every stage, there are certain taboos that must not be breached. Because if you breach that taboo, then the clay pot might crack. And for me, that signifies reconciliation. Because it is also a process. And it is a process that unless there are certain taboos, that we, we, we are not supposed to breach and we breach them, then that reconciliation will not take place. Now, when, man, when a clay pot is manufactured, there are five critical steps. The first step is the collection of the clay. Now, I compare the collection of the clay with the first step towards reconciliation. Because the most important thing is the right type of clay must be collected. If it is not the correct type of clay, then it will not serve the purpose. The second step is the manipulation or the working of the clay. Because we have to mix it with water and we have to manipulate it, we have to make that dough to make sure that the consistency is right. And the water must be according to the quantities that are expected. Otherwise, it will either be too watery or it will be too hard. So the consistency must be right. If the consistency is not right, then the molding, which is the third step, will not bring out what is expected. Post-molding, this clay pot must be taken out to dry. And it must be protected from harsh weather, from the sun and from the wind. But if the taboos that I will mention later were not respected, that clay pot will start to crack. But if it can pass the test of drying, then it goes into the fire. And in the fire, the temperature must be right. So it's a thermodynamic issue. Then thermodynamics come into play. That temperature must be, con it must neither not be too hot, nor should it be too cold. It must be the right temperature. And then it will go out being a nice clay pot that can then be used to serve. Now, the taboos that were not supposed to be breached, for example, if a woman was menstruating or was pregnant, they were not supposed to come next to the clay pit because they exude heat. And that heat would affect the clay pot negatively. So it is important that as we discuss reconciliation, we must, at the back of our minds, think about the process of manufacturing a clay pot. Now, like, the, like manufacturing a clay pot, reconciliation is both a process and an outcome. 
in the process of manufacturing the clay pot, there's a process that you've got to follow, and the outcome is a clay pot. The same applies to reconciliation. It is a process, and the outcome should be a reconciled community, a reconciled nation, a reconciled family, or a reconciled relationship. However, it is a long-term and painful transformational process where broken relationships are to be restored. And it requires a profound change in attitude. Hence, in the manufacturing of a clay pot, if you are sick, you can't go into the clay pit. So if you cannot change your attitude, it means you are still sick. So you cannot go into the processes of reconciliation. It will never be right because you are still bleeding. It is a process of people attempting to deal with haunting memories of the past atrocities and how to overcome them in order to move forward and to move from away from a divided past towards a shared interest or a shared future. It is a bottom-up process because it is about people. It is not something that has to start and end somewhere up there with your political elites or you know, with whoever that would have started the process. It is a bottom-up process that must be rooted in local context and in culture. Even if we've got to compare the Canadian process and the South African process, yes, in terms of con context, in terms of concept, they would be the same, but in terms of context, they will differ. Because each country has got its own unique dynamics. The same applies to the issues at the top, where you've got your political elites, their context, even if they are in the same country, it's different from the context of those who are in the grassroots. However, it requires that government or leadership must be partners in that process to support the, the, to support the, the, the transformational as well as the reconciliational processes from the bottom. Reconciliation is also a social space that allows or encourages people, people who have gone through harmful situation, people who have gone through a lot, people who fought, people who could not even share a space to come together and acknowledge the past. In South Africa, we had to come into one room with the oppressors so that we can be able to sit and share the past. To also grieve together, to also be able to validate the pain and where confessions must be made, the wrongs must be cons confessed. Because you expect that after confessing the wrong, forgiveness must be given, or you've got to ask for forgiveness, and it must be offered back to you. In so doing, we're moving towards restoring broken relationships. Reconciliation has got four key elements, which is the truth, which is justice, reparation, and healing. But it does not end there, because unless we deal thoroughly with issues of structural 
injustice or structural inequality, we will not have done justice to reconciliation. So it is important that structural injustices or structural inequality, systemic discriminational issues, bantu education in our own space, job reservations, all those things that denied us our rights as the majority but the oppressed in South Africa had to be also dealt with. Otherwise, there would not be peaceful coexistence. So it is very important that as we talk about the four elements of reconciliation, we must not forget structural in, uh, injustices or structural in inequalities. Otherwise, there would be no peaceful coexistence between those who were oppressed and their oppressors. And also the issues of trust would actually not be addressed and that would continue to cause serious problems towards uh, efforts of building relationships. Now, like the manufacturing of a clay pot, as I indicated earlier, reconciliation process also has got five critical steps. Developing a shared vision of an interdependent and fair society. And I'm comparing this step with the step of collecting the clay. Because you can never come up with a country's vision unless you bring around the table the right people. And in this instance, moving away from our divided past, both the oppressor and the oppressed have to come together and face each other and decide and think about where they want to see their country in the coming years. Otherwise, if you don't come into one room, then it will be the vision of the black majority or the vision of the white minority. And therefore, we are not all moving in the same direction. So it is about collecting the clay and collecting the right clay. Who was in the room? People talk about the elephant in the room, but I'm not talking about elephants. And maybe here in Canada, we can talk about the bear in the room. <laughs> so it is important that the right people must be in the room to be able to determine where you want to take your country to. Otherwise, we will never be able to achieve what we want to achieve what should be in the clay pot, which is reconciliation. The second step is acknowledging and dealing with the past. Now, I am associating this one with the second step, which is manipulating the clay. Because when you talk about the past, it's not, it's not a nice thing. It is painful. And now when you manipulate that clay, if that clay had feelings, it would actually say, you are hurting me because you are manipulating it. You want to make sure that the consistency is right. And so when you, when you talk about your, your past, it is venting, you know, taking this thing out so that ultimately you are healed because otherwise you will not be molded into something new. You will still remain who you were before you entered the room. So it is important that that thing that is in you must go out. It must go out. You know, I'm reminded of a scripture that's where God says, I am the porter and you are the clay. So if I am the clay, I must allow him to mold me to what he wants to see at the end of the day. And he must mold me according to the assignment that he wants to give me to perform here on earth. So the same applies. We mold the clay pot, we, we manipulate the clay because we want a good product. So you take out the past, you deal with it, you acknowledge it so that you can be able to become a new person who will be able to take on the new path. The third, stage, the third stage is building positive relationships. Now, the molding 
is when you, you bring that, you, you know, you shape that clay pot to what you want. And when you build relationships, it's about getting a product of what you want to see in the country. You want to see, you know, those people who never used even to share a plate, you want to see them molded into one community, into one South Africa. You know, when Nelson Mandela left out of, went out of that jail and he said what he said, he wanted to see a rainbow nation. And we cannot really become a rainbow nation unless we are molded together and we become one. And the fourth step is, is facilitating significant cultural and attitudinal change. Because you have to change. You have to change from what you were. And I believe if you are molded, the clay pot after, mo after molding, that clay has changed. It is a pot. But that pot must now be subjected to, to drying, although it is protected from harsh weather. Now, attitudinal change is also taking you out there. You've got to change your attitude. You've got to be able to, 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 be, to, to become one and see how you adopt not only adopting, but you appreciate the culture of the other. Because if I don't appreciate your culture and you don't appreciate my culture, then it means you cannot move as one. It is for us to appreciate each other and to see each other as people. Because it, 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 it hurts. You know, I'm always reminded of uh, Brooke Benton's song, Oh Lord, Why Lord? when he was asking God, is the color of my skin a sin? You know, why am I regarded you know, as less than a, a person simply because I am black? The last step is enabling substantial social, economical, and political change. Now that is the last step that Earlier on, I said, even if you can focus and succeed on these four key elements of reconciliation, but there is no attempt to correct the political economy of the apartheid system, then we have not achieved anything. Now, I want us to just briefly, within the context that I have shared with you, look at South Africa's journey towards reconciliation, which started in 1995 with the TRC after the fall of apartheid. The TRC was an outcome of the negotiated settlement. And when those negotiations were taking place, you know, if I were to think about what Nelson Mandela was going through, because in his mind was that rainbow nation. When black South Africans were saying, no, people must be charged for what they have done. They wanted retribution and nothing else. They wanted to see people in jail. If they were to be hanged, they had to go to, to be hanged. That's how angry people were. But he was not in the prison cell that he left. He left that prison cell having forgotten about the bitterness that he had gone through. He had to forget about it, and forget, forgetting does not mean that you don't remember it but we remember it in another way. You know, if we have suffered, if we have gone through hardship, there are certain things that I have gone through. But every day when I was like, I'm standing here today, I always say, yo, if I was really still married to that man, I don't think I would have achieved what I have achieved today. 
So it means that he was not supposed to be part of my breakthrough. He was not supposed to be part of my journey. Because if he was still in my life, maybe I would be somewhere out there busy cooking pap for him. <laughs> now here am I. So behind every dark cloud, there's always a silver lining. We don't have to focus on the dark cloud. We must focus on the silver lining. So, and that was Mandela's attitude. But then there were others who were saying no. But he had to make sure that he convinced, he engages, he consults. And you know, he is that man who when he talks to you, whether you like it or not, you will listen. <laughs> and whether you like it or not, he will get what he wants in his very humble way. I, I, you know, I, I appreciate one day when he was engaging, you know, I, I can't remember what Dick said at Cordessa, but he said something just out of the way. And, and, and he looked at him, and when he stood up, didn't he lash on him? He lashed on him. But he will always be doing his, whatever that he does, in a very, in a firm, but humble and respectable way. So in, in his own way, he succeeded that in those negotiations where the National Party was calling for collective amnesty and the people of South Africa were saying, no, we want justice, he actually struck a compromise. And that compromise was that the perpetrators should tell the truth in exchange for amnesty, and that was a compromise, which today the people of South Africa still say Mandela sold us out. And they're saying that simply because the TRC and government has failed Mandela. It is not Mandela who has failed. It is the, 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 the structures post his administration that has failed him. So the ANC's decision was influenced by Nelson Mandela's dream of a prosperous and reconciled nation, the Rainbow Nation. Both parties agreed to a truth for exchange amnesty as a conditional approach, because people had to apply for amnesty. You wouldn't just go, you had to apply. And there was a promise that those who have not applied and who avoid the commission will be charged. So the victims and perpetrators were offered an opportunity to be able to come and tell their stories and listen to each other's stories and ask for forgiveness and be offered forgiveness. And what the men of the cloth the leader of the TRC, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, hoped for as a man of the cloth and with Mandela's values and norms, the assumption was that truth will be followed by forgiveness and forgiveness will be followed by healing and healing will bring about reconciliation. The mandate of the TRC based on the agreements between the National Party and the ANC was to establish a full study to establish fully the causes, the nature, and the extent of the gross violations of human rights committed between March 1960 and May 1994. And that they would do by conducting investigations and creating dignified platforms for victims and perpetrators to be able to tell their stories. It was also to grant amnesty 
to qualifying perpetrators and to make recommendations to government on reparations. The purpose of the TRC was to create a safe space for the victims and perpetrators to come and tell their stories and to confess their wrongs. They had to create a space for truth to be told about the brutal actions of the apartheid regime. The victims were to tell their stories in order to find closure. Perpetrators were expected to ask for forgiveness, and they also expected that the victims would offer them forgiveness. Secrets that were held for de decades had to be exposed. And there was also a very important expectation that the TRC would also facilitate the management of a volcanic eruption because, you know, there was a volcano underneath and the TRC was expected to manage that because if that volcano was left to erupt, we would not have achieved those peaceful, um, you know, peaceful negotiation processes in South Africa. So that, that was the, the purpose of the TRC. I still say, and others also in South Africa, that the period that was given for the TRC from 1960 to 1994 disadvantaged other people. For example, my family was very much dis disadvantaged because my great grandfather and my grandfather, they bought land before the 1913 Land Act. So if the proceedings were starting in 1960, it means all those atrocities that happened prior to 1960 were left out. And most of the people who suffered before 1960 were not part and parcel of the TRC uh, discussions. They were not offered an opportunity to go and tell their stories. I would have wanted to sit with Mr. Brits because when I look at my father's uh, documents and, and the, the, um, the title deeds and everything, he had to sell his farm at a very low price to Mr. Brits. I don't know Mr. Brits, but I would have wanted to speak to him because having bought land before the 1913 Land Act, we also had mineral rights because our farm is actually where there's a lot of gold and uranium, and we lost that. But in that, in that title deed, he, Brits was given half share of our mineral rights. Why? I mean, it was not his share, but he was given half share of our mineral rights. But we were not offered that opportunity to talk to Mr. Brits. What were the limitations and challenges of the TRC? Firstly, it was not accepted by all parties. You know, senior officials in, in the army and, and other senior politicians, both of the national party and the homeland governments, did not want to, to participate in the TRC, so they did not apply. So not everybody supported the TRC. It was also limited to gross human violations, and it excluded the structural inequalities. And therefore, you know, it, it, the political, economical issues were not addressed. Issues of um, systemic discrimination, Bantu education, uh, job reservations, and all the other atrocities that were not politically inclined were not addressed. And therefore, they actually reduced apartheid from being a crime against humanity to politics by excluding those uh, serious issues, structural uh, poverty, 
structural um, disenfranchisement, structural marginal, marginalization, whatever all those things that, you know, that have caused institutional injustice to South Africans. And then post Mandela's administration, government was too slow to pay the reparations. And I'm not even sure even now whether anything is being done. And there was a promise that people who did not apply to participate in the TRC, they would be prosecuted. But until today, they are just working freely. They have never been prosecuted. Now you can imagine if you see your perpetrator working there freely and actually still benefiting more than what you are benefiting, what is going on in you, in, your, in, in the person as an individual. And public participation was limited to those who were within that category of political uh, injustices. And all the other people were excluded. But also, it was based on the merit of the TRC. If you had applied and they felt that you don't qualify, then you were excluded. So for me, it was still a top-down process where the decisions were taken by the elite and it actually excluded participation of the majority. The reconciliation outcome was also based on the assumption that top-down political settlement will result in bottom-up approval of the settlement. There was an assumption that was made that when the what the political elite have agreed upon, the, the, the grassroots will automatically accept and they will not question anything. And the top elite was actually wrong because people are questioning many things and they still cannot find the truth. What happened after the TRC? It started and it ended. What happened? Desmond Tutu talks about the unfinished business. The business has never been completed and that is a pain in the poor man's heart because for him, at least before he, he joins the angels up there, I, I, I suppose because he's a man of the cloth, he'll be singing hallelujahs there one day. But I believe that in his heart, his wish was that as he, before he dies, at least something must be done. But the business is still an unfinished business. Slow payment of reparations. There was supposed to have been a once-off wealth tax from the rich minority, which was supposed to address issues of poverty amongst the black ma majority, but that was not done. It was not even enacted. So how can it even be implemented when it was not even enacted? There was failure to prosecute those who were declined amnesty. Poverty and inequality is increasing. For the development studies uh, professors, I'm sure you know the man called Todaro. You know, I still remember, you know, way back when I was still doing my first honors many, many years ago. Some of you were not born yet. There was a question posed in that textbook third world economies. What has happened to poverty? What has happened to unemployment? What has happened to inequality? And what has happened to freedom? But as a government, 24 years, there has never been a time 
where government took a back seat to reflect and ask questions as to why is poverty increasing? Why inequality is increasing? Why is the gap widening? Nothing. The only ish thing that is happening is that when, if, when an administration changes and another one takes over, each and every one wants his or her own legacy to be written. And we start changing names of programs. The same thing, you know, we just take old wine or, and put it in new wine skins, and we are not changing actually anything. There's no significant change in the material circumstances of the previously disadvantaged, while the minority is still controlling the economy and related resources. Our education system is failing, and corruption is the order of the day. We talk the Guptas, the, every day is Gupta, and one of the planes comes from Canada. <laughs> so Canadians, what are you doing for us? There's one plane of the Guptas that comes from somewhere here. But fail, the TRC has also failed to address structural inequality, which is the root cause of a widening rift of the South African nation. The rich are getting richer. The poor are getting poorer. See, I, I just wanted here to, to make some kind of a comparison to say, um, we started there developing a shared vision, the clay collection, the TRC. The TRC is that. And then acknowledging and dealing with the past, clay manipulation, truth-telling victims and perpetrators telling their stories, and, and building of positive relationships, which is clay, clay molding. We have not achieved this. It was just about being civil to each other. And there, there's no formalized local programs. It ended up there, and there's nothing happening on the ground to continue with the process. It ended up there with the top elites, and nothing is happening. And that is actually where we are, where people are. Nothing is happening. Then the fourth stage is that facilitating significant cultural attitudinal, the pot drying. Now we, we don't see, you know, this pot is not able to withstand the conditions outside. So there's re-emergence of violence. There's a widespread protests, attacks on foreign nationals, and there's corruption. The fifth stage there, the pot firing, inequality is rising, injustices, separation is continuing. So actually, we are stuck here. We stuck here, and we, 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 we have never been able to move up there, except for trying to be friendly to each other and without anything happening. The broken clay pot. Now, if the pot cannot stand the fire, it explodes. And we have exploded as a nation, the clay pot is broken. The nation is polarized. Hugs and kisses were not enough. Reconciliation is not about hugs and kisses. It's not about being civil to each other. It's about significant change. It's about significant transformation. It's about justice. There can never be reconciliation without transformation. There can never be reconciliation without justice. And justice is not about people getting killed, but it is about injustices being addressed. What people expected did not come around, and they began to question the role and the benefit of the TRC. There's growing resentment of those who escaped justice and accountability because they were not pro prosecuted as expected. Widespread pro uh, protests, as I indicated, and attacks on foreign nationals. 
There's manifestations of old and new forms of mass exclusions. And there's no significant cultural and attitudinal change. If I was called a kafir before 1994, I am still a kafir, even today. So there, is, there has been no change. The spirit of togetherness, of caring, and of Ubuntu is not only lost between us and white South Africa, but even between us as black South Africans. Because inequality is now no longer a racial issue. It's a multiracial issue. There are those black elites who are billionaires up there at the expense of the poor on the ground. And I don't know whether you are aware of this theory of prahalad, wealth at the bottom of the pyramid. Instead of creating awareness and thanks to the asset-based community development, ABCD Cody, we call it ABCD Cody, because now we're able to go out there and create awareness at the bottom of the pyramid that you are actually richer than you think. You have got a lot of money. For you, it is to come up with a strategy as to how you keep that money within your community. Because Prahalad was creating awareness at the top of the pyramid by saying, don't ignore the bottom of the pyramid. There is actually a lot of wealth there. What you've got to do is to come up with a market that can work for the poor so that you are able to extract what you, are, what you can extract from them. So we've got to turn that pyramid upside down and make people aware to, by saying that you don't have to allow people from the top to come and take your wealth. Let this wealth stay in the community. So Nelson Mandela's dream of a rainbow nation is yet to be realized. There's lack of social cohesion and South Africa is a polarized nation. What are the missing pieces? There are many, many, but I've just uh, decided to focus on four. Social, social cultural transformation, progressive leadership, a new mindset, and community-driven economy. Now we've been talking about attitudinal change and we've been talking about cultural change because if, if that is not happening, then reconciliation is but a dream. So to achieve social cultural transformation, there must be cultural, attitudinal and institutional change. And in order to achieve that, we have together to build new institutions and systems that meet the particular needs of society and their future challenges. And we cannot do that if we are not, if the process is not localized. Because the, you've got to understand what is happening on the ground in order to change your systems to become responsive, not only to the challenges, but also the opportunities that are existing at that level. And we've got to expand democracy beyond governance to a cultural value that guarantees popular participation, that tolerates dissent, because it doesn't mean that if I don't agree with you, I am the bad person. That recognizes people's rights and that protects individuals' freedoms. Now, in South Africa, we've got a local government that is supposed to be participatory. But unfortunately, it is not participatory. It, it is participatory to those who belong to a specific political party. If the, the chair of the watch committee is an ANC a member, then that structure is benefiting only members of the ANC. So it is not a community development structure. It is still a political party. So we've also got to strengthen the education system to enable critical thinking, innovation, and creativity 
and to ensure that the curriculum that is delivered is current and it is also relevant to the hopes and aspirations and challenges of society. So we've got to strengthen the education system. Our education system in South Africa is failing. Instead of improving the standards, you know, people pass couple, now I'm, I'm, I'm now speaking Sitswana and I'm even forgetting. What is 30%? You know, when my kids attended school, they attended a school that was uh, based on an American system called Accelerated Christian Education. And who could not proceed to the next pace or the next level unless you have passed the, the level with 80%, because it could only accommodate 20% lack of knowledge. Because the, if you fail, if you get 80%, it means 20% lack of knowledge. <laughs> now, if you pass at 30%, it means a 70% lack of knowledge. Now, how do you continue? How do you proceed? So our standards are, I mean, yes. So we have to also identify, define, evaluate, and actualize the assets and capabilities of people while their needs and aspirations are being anticipated and met. We, we should not be creating a dependent society as if people do not have assets. Sometimes we even overemphasize poverty. You know, our development language is disempowering because we talk about the poorest of the poor. You know, we are going to assist and help. we are so obsessed with helping to a point of killing a nation. We have killed South Africans because of the obsession that we are holding to help. And sometimes even this obsession is meant to cater for the interests of the politicians because it is shortcuts. You know, we want to do things shortcut. We want to deliver food parcels and social grants as much as we can so that people can vote for us. And when you talk about development, because it is a process, you're saying, no, no, this will, will waste our time. We want to do it quickly. So our pro-poor policies are not implemented in a developmental manner that aims to empower people, but to disempower them. <laughs> so it is important that the assets and capabilities of people must be recognized and thanks to Cody, you still have got a lot of work in South Africa. I wish I could take this institution you know, home so that it can be located there and we can start with the president up there because unless the president understands A, B, C, D, then we've got a lot of work to do. So I'm, I'm, I still really am looking for a way. Uh, yeah, fortunately, there's some way that I have, I've got to get to the president. <laughs> and I'm going to sit with him informally. You know, I'm going to use other channels because, you know, I've, I have a brother who was married to his wife's <laughs> what, what, what. So I will use those channels to get to him so that I can tell him about ABCD. And, in, and, and ask him, can we please just you know, get onto your, your, your big aeroplane and go to Canada and just go and sit for a day with God. <laughs> and when you leave Canada, you will be a changed man. You will know what we need in South Africa because we just need ABCD. That's, that's it. We just need ABCD. We don't need too much. We just need ABCD. So we must also create space for research institutions to lead societal development and higher institutions to produce relevant capacity because that is, what, that is what we need. We need progressive leadership. We don't need leadership that is going to collude with the Guptas. We need progressive leadership and for social cultural transformation also to happen we need 
progressive leadership. I've, I've, I've got the, the Royal Bafokeng Nation. I'm, I'm working with the Royal Bafokeng Nation. And the leadership is progressive. The Queen Mother loves ABCD. You know, when I run workshop, workshops there, she is here. She spends a week with us because she just loves the concept. Now, when I get back home, she said, my, my, my girl, now you must go and teach the king. Go and, go and, and educate our king about ABCD. Because it's not enough for me to understand it. I am his mother, but I am not holding the purse. And I'm not taking the decisions. Because I was talking about all those schools in his area, that they must stop buying uniform from somewhere else. They must buy uniform from the cooperatives that are within the community. Because if we've got to, to, to regenerate the community economy, we've got to make sure that we promote local, we buy local, and we, 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 we support the local, local uh, ent enterprises, your rural and urban enterprises as well as cooperatives. So we need enlightened political elites with the capacity to lead change and who will also encourage popular participation, who will not be uh, you know, threatened by the educated. Because you know, it, there was a stage where my former president said that, you know these edu educated fools, you know? <laughs> For him, you know, yeah, but let me not talk about him. His relative is here. <clears throat> They will go and tell him. So we need leaders who are in touch with their communities. A leader that is not in touch with his or her communities is not a leader. We need those who can also advocate change from a place of common experience in order to be able to influence development of appropriate and relevant policies. We need leaders who drive strategies that are aimed at significant societal change and not window dressing to simply attract attention. Because you know, sometimes we even implement these huge projects just to look smart in other countries. And yet those huge initiatives don't benefit your community. I mean, South Africa, we are, we've got a very serious problem with toll gate, with those, uh, what do you call those things? E-tolls. E now we've got to pay the e-tolls, and we are, now I'm refusing. I'm not paying the e-toll. I'm not. <laughs> Every time they sent me an account, I said, no, I was never consulted. I don't have to be paying. I mean, I'm paying fuel tax. I'm paying tax. I'm paying so many taxes. Now I still have to be taxed on the road. No. I'm refusing to pay e tolls. And I, I'm not the only one who's refusing to pay e tolls. So we need a state that is committed to change and that is armed with a vision of change. We also need to promote community driven development, like I mentioned the Royal Buffer King. And this is my passion, that is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to change the mindsets of our communities to begin to see economic power, you know, to value the economic power they have. Every year, I mean, we, the, the, our social budget is billions. And, and where does the money go? It goes to your spas, to your shop rights, to your big retailers, because the, the, the department has actually located the grant payment infrastructure in these big uh, retail, retail stores. Now, what we are saying is we must actually encourage cooperatives, our worker cooperatives, women stock fells, women burial societies to pull their funds together so that they can be able to establish their own uh, purchasing cooperatives. And though that grant payment infrastructure must go into the community so that the, grant, the grantees, people who receive grants, must buy from their own community and not go out. So we are facilitating those linkages. And over and above that, we've got to also conscientize our people, but we also have got to develop 
community asset-based thinking capacity. And that is what my PhD initiative is all about. To, for people to, you know, uh, because I really want to see how that would uh, change the, 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 um, the, the choices, the buying choices of people. Because once you know, then it has to change. Something must click and something must change. We must also ensure an enabling environment for community-owned enterprises to leverage the purchasing power of place-based institutions. That is your universities, your hospitals, your schools. I'm working with the University of Pretoria that is located in a township called Mamelodi. And now we have developed an anchor institution strategy that is actually focusing on empowering uh, small businesses and cooperatives. As I speak, they are now incubating three cooperatives on campus. They have created a, a block. There's a block that they have uh, set aside where those uh, cooperatives are operating from. And there's a business clinic that is supporting them, but it is also supporting small enterprises in the township. So the, 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 that institution is responding now as a place-based institution. What is left only when I was discussing with the dean is that they must also make sure that they link these cooperatives to the economic opportunities that emerge from the universities. So now we are working on the cooperatives making academic regalia so that we can go and host a show where they can showcase how they can make those gowns. And the gowns should not be a monopoly of Depenar and Reinek because that is the only company in South Africa that is selling uh, uh, academic regalia to all universities in South Africa, Depenar and Reinek. And there's also Gordon and Harris. That is the only company in the whole of South Africa that is taking photographs in all universities. Now, I was saying to the dean, do you mean you, we can't, when, when our young people are technology savvy, do you mean they can't actually take photographs? So we've got to change the thinking and the mindset in our institutions so that public spending must benefit the public. The new mindset. We talked about localization of reconciliation. Now that requires a new mindset. Now there is an initiative in Sierra Leone which I want us to look at, and if we cannot draw any lessons from that. But we've got to create a new mindset with the capacity to facilitate and engage in programs to promote forgiveness and reconciliation in communities. We need to promote and support initiatives that will assist people to engage in the process of self-forgiveness. You know, you cannot forgive others unless you yourself have forgiven yourself. It starts with you. And, and sometimes it is a very difficult thing, but I have experienced it. Because you know, when uh, my husband, who is now the late, who is now the late, whatever that he was doing, there was a day when the you know, sometimes you, you, you would think that something, you're just thinking about something, but it's God talking to you. I had to go to him and his concubine. And that time we were still married. And I said to him, and this woman, I have just come to tell you that I have forgiven you from the bottom of my heart. Because if you don't feel anything for me, honestly, I cannot force you. But I believe that you have to be, it's, a, it's only maturity at a certain level that can enable you to do that. Because it's not an easy thing. But I went and I spoke to him and I said, I forgive you. And if also I have said anything or done anything, forgive me too. And I had to forgive myself for whatever that I don't know. But I just said, let me forgive myself also, because I have to move on. Now, what happens to me as an individual, it's something that also has to happen at a community level. And we also have got to 
promote and support initiatives that foster forgiveness at community level with the potential to build and rebuild relationships such as cultivating dialogues. And those dialogues must not be dialogues only amongst us as black South Africans. And this is what is happening now. You know, we go to communities, we conduct dialogues, but with who? Do we have the right people? It must be a dialogue amongst all of us, black, white, yellow, and silver. All of us, if there's a silver person. Because if we are in Lechtenberg, where I come from, and we only sit there in a quiet corner as black South Africans, the vision that we'll come up with is our vision. It's not the vision for Lechtenberg. The vision for Lechtenberg requires black, white, Indian, colored, all of us go, get into a room, let's fight, let's argue, let's cry, but ultimately we'll come up with a vision. And if we support it as a collective, we will be able to move forward. And uh, starting grassroots initiatives. As a collective, we will come up with an action plan. We will come up with activities. What is it that we've got to do? You know, how can we make sure that we are molded in one and become a clay pot? We must do A, B, C, D, E, and we agree, and we start working on those things as a collective. We must utilize the healing power of sharing stories and develop the victim offender programs. My Bible in Romans 6 says, when we adopt a new mindset, we are no longer enslaved to the old ways of thinking. We are empowered by the new. What can we learn from Sierra Leone? That is the fumble talk model. It's an African community-based initiative which is grounded in local context and culture and aimed at promoting sustained reconciliation in Sierra Leone. It is based on the understanding that reconciliation is a long-term process. It's not an overnight thing. It ensures community engagement through consultations, that is community-led reconciliation, starting with determining the readiness of people to, concile, to reconcile and then implementing that is piloting community-owned reconciliation processes, incorporating lessons learned from the pilots, and rolling out to other areas. Training that is about empowering community stakeholders and reconciliation ceremonies that is now preparing the village, uh, people at a village level to be able to talk about you know, the truth and talk about the things that hurt them, et cetera and to have follow-up activities, that is collective activities that strengthen the community. Let's, have, let's, let's play ball together. Let's, let's, let's have sports together. It should not just be, you know, whites there go rugby, and then blacks there, you know, when you go to a rugby stadium, it's only whites. When you go to a soccer stadium, it's only blacks. I mean, we are not really going anywhere. It is, con we are continuing uh, with, 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 with the apartheid. Collectively, as we are seated here, I think we can reflect as a collective here and at home and in the few days to come and even in the long term. But in summary, I can say that the past was not adequately dealt with in South Africa and I think also in Canada. However, I say this with caution, acknowledging that every country is unique and would deal with its issues differently. What I shared is my reflection from a South African perspective and a basis for further engagement, as well as discovery of other missing pieces, and I hope that you will find it useful. Some reflective questions that I pose, what was the tipping point in the Canadian TRC towards reconciliation? Are there any similarities with South Africa's? And how is Canada dealing with limitations of her TRC process? We would like to draw lessons from your experiences. In conclusion, I would like to say to all of us that we shaped clay into a pot, but it is the emptiness inside 
that holds whatever we want. And I would like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to the Cody Chair for Social Justice Committee, the Sisters of St. Martha, senior executives of both St. FX University and Cody, the St. FX professors and Cody facilitators, Cody participants and St. FX students, my Cody family and their partners, wives and husbands, because you know I've been spoiled during the Thanksgiving weekend. I, yeah, I emptied the budgets of some families here. <laughs> And I don't want to be held responsible, but I know that, you know, efforts were taken. But I'm saying to you in my language, my Cody family, he who eats last is the king because we get the best of all of them. I love my family. I love my Cody family. And above all, I want to thank God for this opportunity because it is not because I am smart, but it is just by his grace and his mercy. And I thank you very much. Thank you and thank you. <laughs>